It's uh, great to be here with um, somebody I've admired, worked with, um, and, uh, and sometimes arm wrestled with uh, in the education reform movement. Randy Weingarten, you know who she is from her bio, but the interesting thing about Randy is that she is rethinking the role of the union in public education. She has been very open-minded. We have two great teachers unions in the United States, the American Federation of Teachers, of which she leads, and the National Education Association, which has not been quite, I can say it, you can't probably, but quite as open to let's think about new ideas. So it's great to have you here at an Ideas here. Festival, and also to have a sponsor. I see a lot of people in the school reform movement here too. So what I will do is make sure we get to questions pretty early on, but I'm gonna start with the question of teachers. We keep saying teachers are the most important uh, aspect of this whole thing, and yet there's, you know, it's easier to become a dentist or any other profession. We don't have any way to train or gate a teacher. So um, I used to tell the story that it took me longer to get my permanent certification as a New York City school teacher than to go to law school and pass the bar and be admitted to the bar. Um, and, you know, part of that is because of all of the, you know, we have 50 state systems. They're all very different. They're all pretty complicated. And, but they're all of really unequal quality. And you see that in terms of um, when teachers walk into classrooms. And, you know, many of us will have walked into classrooms with everything that's going on in the sink or swim method, where it was viewed as a rite of passage that you were one page ahead of your students in classes that you may never have taught before. And so, you know, what you see from the countries that outcompete us, that what one of the things that is a real um, uh, lever is preparation. Now, that pretty much makes sense if you think about the other professions, think about law, think about medicine. But lots of us think that the preparation schools for teachers these days, the old normal schools, the new teachers colleges, that they too are of unequal quality. And lots of people like Walter has been amazing in terms of pushing alternative methods like Teach for America because we want to incentivize people who really want to become teachers. But that too is of unequal quality and a lot of folks from Teach for America come in for a few years and leave in something that is a knowledge profession. In fact, in our knowledge profession, half of our teachers leave within three to five years. So preparation from all these different angles, you see how important preparation is as opposed to the sink or swim method that we normally have for teachers. So do so, you have a plan? Would so after proposal? all of this thinking, this is we have a task force in the American Federation of Teachers now thinking about preparation. And so one of the proposals we've been thinking about, and that until yesterday I never uttered out loud, was why don't we do in teaching what they do in medicine and law, which is a bar exam. So before one actually walks into a classroom, one has to be credentialed in that kind of way, but not simply a paper pencil exam. Because what is most important in terms of teaching is not simply the content. The content you know is really important. But what's, and, and loving kids is really important. And wanting to teach and make a difference in the lives of kids is really important. But what's really, really, really important is how we differentiate instruction. How we go to our toolkit and understand that Walter is different than Randy. That Celia is different than Michael. That, and how we actually engage with kids to try to create that seminal moment of learning. So and you're talking so, about an actual professional exam exactly. administered by a professional group or so, by the state? So what we can do is there's a bunch of ways of doing this because I don't, we can walk right into the, um, we can walk right into the um, debate about you know, 50 different states and 50 different laws and things like that. But just like when Shanker talked about the National Board for Teaching, so that there was a higher standard for the greatest teachers, 
We could have a national board that comes up with a national standard and then ask states to adopt it, just like we're trying to do with the Common Core. Instead of forcing it, asking them to adopt it. Mm -hmm. And if we did something like that, which could be nimble, so it could so so the bar exam today may look totally different than the bar exam in 10 years from now. Mm -hmm. Today, for example, we have to teach kids how to critically think. Not some kids, but all kids. And I suspect, and I hope I'm not being controversial here. Lots of the schools that your kids and grandkids have gone to are schools that do project-based instruction, are schools where kids really learn how to critically think. Mm -hmm. But we have to do that for all kids now because the, the jobs of the future are about thinking, are about applying knowledge. Mm -hmm. So consequently, what teachers need to do today is really learn how to do that. They can't simply be, okay, we're gonna memorize the mathematical tables and just talk about how to do that. We have to actually engage kids in real meaningful life. That's different than what we had to do even when I started teaching. So your big idea is a bar exam for teachers. My, one of our yeah. big ideas because, and but I think if we have a bar exam for teachers, then what happens is we immediately um, ensure that the preparation for teachers is going to be there at the front end because we're not going to allow people to walk into classrooms without a baseline preparation. And then the other thing it does is it stops this argument between is alternative certification better, is TFA better, is teacher fellows better, or is traditional teacher colleges better? Because what happens is if everybody has to go through this, then there could be many different routes in. So, so in other words, just by getting the credentialism of a teacher's college, you might be better off going to an alternative route, either just uh, <coughs> learning physics, for example, or being in Teach for America and thus getting your certificate. And you know what we'll know? In five years from when this um, idea is enacted, mm -hmm. then we'll start having data about that. Now you're in favor. Then we'll start knowing. Then we'll start knowing. You know, on a on a grander scale, not on a one-off scale. Maybe alternative certification, where you really have the content knowledge, is better than a teaching college that is focused more on pedagogy instead of content. And so it will help inform the way the roots into teaching, in some ways, like the Flexner report did for um, medicine. Uh, but you would have some fights at the beginning on whether or not, the, say it's a physics high school teacher, whether you're going to be testing a whole lot of physics or testing in the classroom situation, how well can he, she or he See, react? See, I think you have to do two things in this. You have to have a clinical piece because we know from experience. Clinical means they'll be in the class hands-on and test. Meaning that, they, that new teachers have to demonstrate some baseline classroom management and some baseline ability to engage with students and to teach. That's really, really important. That's why what, what, what we, like when I, look, I came through the alternative route. I had a student teaching experience in a junior high school. I was a high school um, social studies teacher. So, and my experience was very limited. I wasn't prepared for teaching. The first day that I taught my, and I was a litigator that came from a Wall Street firm. My first day of teaching, I remember my course, I was teaching about Lockean social contracts. Mm -hmm. And I was scared to death. Mm -hmm. I could talk to adults, but I couldn't talk to high school students that were taller than me. <laughs> so, but you know, and what happened for me is by my fifth year, by my second year of teaching, I was more confident. By my fifth year, I loved it and I didn't want to leave. But now, that clinical piece then becomes really important in terms of having the confidence to deal with children and to also be able to have high expectations, not just to exhort about high expectations, but have it. So love is important. You have to love kids to be a school teacher. Number two, you have to know your content. And number three, you have to have a pedagogical bag of tricks so that you can differentiate instruction and to all the And the test would we do need. all of that in, I, in well, theory. The test would probably not be able to assess whether you love kids. Well, that's one of the more important elements. Right. So would you continue the testing like every three or four years? I, look, what I wouldn't, I wouldn't continue the testing every three or four years for the following reason. 
everything at that point becomes aligned to the district that you're in. And, you're, and so at the end of the day, what good teachers, what we've seen is that the schools that work, the districts that work, are the ones where, if we really believe that teaching quality is as important as we say, are the ones where districts and schools have collaborative environments, where there's a real thoughtful process for how you recruit, support, retain, and yes, dismiss teachers. Because the other, probably, Walter knows this, many of you probably don't know this, look, we, the unions, and I include myself, I was the president of the Teachers Union in New York City for 12 years. We were wrong. Not that we meant to be wrong, but our job initially was about fairness, not about quality. That's how we were created, to try to be, to try to ensure that teachers and our other members were treated fairly. But in this day and age, our job has to be about quality as well as fairness. Wait, wait, so if your job is so, about quality. So, what we ended up doing is we said, look, due process has to be about fairness, not about job security for life not about being used an excuse for managers not to manage or a cloak for incompetence. So on the back end of this, we actually have said we need to have real evaluation systems that can assess whether teachers are doing their jobs. And if they're not, you help them. And if they're not, they shouldn't be teachers. Well, it's a real evaluation system. Real evaluation that doesn't systems. sound that different from what I asked, which is continually testing them. So what I'm saying is that I'm not talking about a paper pencil test. I'm talking about a real evaluation system that is aligned with the district. So how do we get a real evaluation system? That's been one of the great struggles. We have more meetings in Aspen on this. Okay, than New Haven, Pittsburgh. Aspen actually did a great, Ross Weiner did a great yeah. report. Is Ross here? Is Ross? No. He did a great, uh, the Aspen did a great report on what's going on in Pittsburgh, and they just did a new report. Aspen just did a great new report about evaluation systems. but. Let's do a field trip to New Haven, mm -hmm. because New Haven, I think, is now, is now the front runner in terms of the development of a first class gold standard evaluation system, which is a developmental system and an evaluation system. Um, and what you're seeing is a, a transformation in that city, including the fact that Yale saw, you know, so it started with a new teacher's contract. Um, which the mayor mm -hmm. very much, Mayor DiStefano, very much endorsed. Um, it's the mayor, the district, the union. And a lot of people scoffed at it because they thought, oh, this is an agreement to agree. There's a lot of committees in here. There's a lot of voice for teachers in here. But what happened was all those committees, they actually did their work ahead of schedule. And they actually put this evaluation system together, constructed it ahead of schedule. Mm -hmm. And in the first year of the evaluation system, what ended up happening, and this was the moment for the union, about, I don't know, 80 of the 1,800 teachers got dinged by it, got told they were bad teachers, got told they were ineffective, and they got help. And after the help, half of them still were ineffective. Instead of going to arbitration, every single one of those folks resigned or retired. Now, there were people within our How unions. Many? Every single one of uh, the folks that got that well, you said, okay, but, resigned or retired. I mean, how many, though, were saved by the intervention versus? Half. Forced? Okay. About, I think it was 35, 40, these, sorry. Uh, facts. I yeah. think it was 42 that were saved and the balance were not. Yeah, because that's a yeah. question here, too, when it's not just to try to find the bad teacher and run yes. them out of the woods. It's like some can be helped. Because from, so from my perspective, that's fairness. But from the perspective of children as well, that is, this is an all game here. This is a, we have to help all kids, not some kids. We have to ensure, and so what it means is you can't just have a couple of good teachers. What we have to do is try to ensure good to great, all teachers. Now, and, in, and in fact, what we see in Finland, unlike in the United States, is that the difference in schools variation is like this. Finland is the top school um, system in the in the world. The difference in variation in schools in the United States is like this. Um, okay, but getting back to finding the teachers that don't do well, how do you assess them? I mean, you can pick the New Haven model or if you have a better one, what percentage of that 
is just based on pure empirical data of the kids did or did not improve in reading and math? Okay, that's a really good question. But think about this. 80% of the teachers teach subjects other than reading and math. So, well, well, but, but I mean, let's focus on that contentious issue, which is the reading and math scores for those type of right. teachers. How big of a, uh, you know, part should that be of the okay. assessment? So, I'm not a geek. Yes, you are. I am. You know, I'm one of those touchy You're feely. A geek wannabe. I'm like one of those touchy feely, smushy kind of people. Okay. You know, so I know nobody thinks that a labor leader is a touchy feely, smushy kind of person. But so there has to be three or four components of a good evaluation system. Component number one is do teachers have the tools and conditions they need to teach? Do they? I mean, we have this focus about high expectations, but we also have to have a focus about high supports. Number two, well, let me have stop. I taught it? Okay, okay well, look, can we stop at each one? Sure, I think sure. That, one. that sounds like a code word for excuses, meaning you know, at least in Teach for America, we have the rule, no excuses, you know. Well, the blackboard isn't in the classroom and there are no books. No excuses, et cetera. If you say the first component is, has my district given me all the tools and all the things I need to teach, that becomes, I've got an excuse, number one out of the game. Okay. I didn't say all, but frankly, let me ask you this. Would Tiger Wood not have clubs when he goes golfing? Yeah, but that, I mean, we can I do mean, a lot of metaphors. I mean, is that uh, as you know, in New Orleans, where we have a group of schools, the, there's a set of them in eastern New right. Orleans that are still in FEMA trailers, and they're all clustered together, right. dozens not, of them. I'm not three saying Three or four that. of those mm -hmm. are the ones mm -hmm. that are the top three or four in the LEAP tests. I and, am, but yeah. what I'm saying, and I don't mean to interrupt, is this. There's no other profession in the world where we don't actually try to ensure that people have some of the tools that they need to help. That, and so what we're saying then is that teachers themselves, I mean, I taught in New York City where we had to scavenge for chalk in mm -hmm. the 1990s when I taught there. Mm -hmm. My kids um, in some of the classes that I taught um, were part of the civics competitions about the Bill of Rights. Mm -hmm. and beat schools like Scarsdale and other places but in these competitions. But you have now just proven my point. What I'm saying is that I still had a bunch of other tools, meaning I had a lot of support, I had people who helped us with lesson plans, I had a principal who made sure that we had the materials that we needed and could have the funds that we needed to get these kids into these competitions. We did some fundraising ourselves, but we had some of this. What I'm saying is that you can't actually say to a new teacher, you're going to teach the Common Core, which is a more rigorous kind of methodology to teach, and just basically say you're on your own to do it. It's not fair to the kids. It's not fair to the teachers. I'll give you another example. We are actually engaged in this project in McDowell County to revitalize not just the education system, but the entire community. <laughs> this is the eighth poorest community in America. We talk about how kids need broadband. I mean, how kids need technology. There's no technology, there's no broadband in the district. Mm -hmm. If you actually, there is, what, there's a T line. So in the high school in the district, if you actually use the security system, then kids have no access to internet. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying is that that is a baseline tool. That's not an excuse, that's a baseline tool. Now, will teachers teach every day regardless of having these tools? Yes, but if we're really trying to say, all kids and ensure that they get to the knowledge that we need, then they have to have, we have to have baseline well, tools. Let, let me stipulate so we can move on that, that it is important, the whole environment, the family, you know, whether they come with, you know, nutrition, whether they, you know, eat well, whether they have access to internet, whether there are tools in the classroom. It does seem if you, though, and let me just say, if you're going to make that number one, Okay, I'll make it number three. Well, thank you. Okay. Because in all some of them are ways, important. We are not going to fix right. the fact that some kids come from poor households and some kids come from rich households. And if we say we're only going to judge our teachers first and foremost by right. them having all the tools and the broadband to the home that they need. Right. But remember it's an excuse for teachers not to have to perform. Okay, but remember, 
I didn't say all. Oh, no. I said some, and I said that it's not fair to either kids or teachers to basically have the sink or swim me methodology. And this debate about no excuses, and I know you're going to get mad when I say this, <laughs> it's a false debate because two-thirds of the achievement gap is because of socioeconomic conditions. Think about it this way. The achievement gap between rich and poor is double the achievement gap between um, white and black. Right. And so all I'm saying is this is not an either or strategy. This is an and both strategy. And we need to confront poverty, not to say it's an excuse, but figure out how we mitigate it. But let I me get to I'll the- I will agree, I mean, and it is a false debate, and it is true that two thirds of uh, a student achievement may be correlated just right. to the background, the poverty, whatever they come from. I will say, and I think I'm right with my math, one third isn't, and that's really where the teacher comes right. in. And there's a huge variation between teachers who can deal with that one third and save a child and teachers who just have excuses. And I, well, let me say that, I, look, I represent teachers. My mom was a teacher, she taught for 29 and a half years before she had cancer and couldn't teach anymore because she didn't have the energy. My, my teachers have saved my life. Mm -hmm. So I think that most teachers want to teach. And I think that what we need to do, though, is some can't. And we have to deal with that. And they shouldn't be in the profession. Mm -hmm. And there's a whole bunch of them that we can actually improve. And so the other two pieces, which are probably from your perspective and from this audience perspective, the most important is, did I teach it? and did kids learn it? Mm -hmm. So I think about it in that way, in terms of evaluation systems. Did I teach it? And then did kids learn it? Because those are two different things. And so the data that you're talking about is really, really important in terms of did kids learn it? Because I may think that I did the best lesson in the world. Mm -hmm. Like I used to love teaching about um, Hiroshima and about how you, and having a debate about whether or not um, uh, bombing Hiroshima was the right thing to do. And so I, I used to think that was, that was my most exciting class. But you know, on the Regents, I taught in New York. If I was devastated when my kids didn't really get, sometimes, what the import was in terms of World War II. Now, I still thought it was a great class, mm -hmm. but still, the, there's, you have to look at the data to see if kids get it. So that's important in terms of continuous improvement. Now, what happens, say, three years in a row, elementary school teacher, fifth grade, kids each year did badly on fractions. That's a problem. And that's where the data comes in. And so the issue really becomes, you look at, and we've said in terms of evaluation systems, we are not opposed to having standardized tests as a component of student learning. We've said that. But it can't be the sole or the predominant um, device. And so then somebody says, OK, what's the magic? So in lots of places, like New York, they say it's 20%. N N Connecticut just came up with a um, new law. They say it's 25%. Mm -hmm. I don't know, Walter, mm -hmm. what the magic number is. I know that it is you have to have enough data so that people concentrate on it. But when it becomes predominant, then education becomes about testing and not about teaching. And frankly, the current generation of tests have no connection with what we need to teach kids right now. The current generation of tests are about memorization of facts, as opposed to about how kids critically think. And I've watched school system after school system around this country actually focus only on what those test scores are and only on the high stakes consequential decisions of those tests as opposed to doing the teaching and learning and the engagement that we need to do with kids. You think that's really one of the biggest problems? I think the testing fixation is one of the biggest problems in American schools right now, I do. Mm -hmm. I've watched it throughout, I've watched, look, we have right now in America, the highest, I'm not saying this is good, but I'm just saying this is the facts. We have the highest graduation rates that we've ever had. We ha also have the highest um, uh, 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 literacy rates and math rates that we've ever had. But in the last 10 years, during the No Child Left Behind era, 
the rate of increase is actually much of less. Illi of literacy? Of literacy. The rate of increase is actually much less than it was the 10 or 20 years beforehand. The rate of literacy um, after the Johnson um, war on poverty was much higher mm -hmm. than the rate right now. And what's happening in schools a lot is that everybody is totally fixated on English and math tests as opposed to fixated on teaching and learning. And, and that becomes, so you see, test prep and test prep and test prep as opposed to taking the risk to really engage young people in terms of learning. Now, well, you know. you've noticed, I'm not saying get rid of tests. Mm -hmm. And we, as a union, are very much into the Common Core and how you actually implement it. Um, and we have a lot of controversy about that within the ranks because people don't want to see it default to yet another testing machination. How do you think digital technology will uh, impact this? Um, I think it both impacts, look, digital technology has a huge role in education and I hope that we use it um, in really good ways. I think that some people think that it supplants, mm -hmm. um, but I think that we've seen with K-12 Inc. and others that when you look at the data, it can't really supplant. I think that David Brooks pr probably said the best um, was, was more um, prescient about this than anyone in my, my space, where he talked about um, how teaching is very relational. And so you need to have technology as a key component in education. I think it is hugely important in terms of reinforcing. I think it's hugely important in terms of remediation. I think it makes, it makes the quality of what we do so much richer. And as you know, um, someone just told me a couple of days ago, we've become, the AFT has become the biggest disruptor in the education space right now because we just started, we launched mm -hmm. last week at, at the Goldman Sachs Stanford um, um, Technology Summit, Education Technology Summit, um, what will become the biggest online resource for teachers. And so it is a resource platform where teachers can upload and download information, share with each other, all aligned with the Common Core. There's 200,000 resources on it. Um, when we launched it, and all for free. Mm -hmm. And both this um, British entity that we have um, partnered with, private company, and us, the FT, we've invested jointly $10 million to um, create this platform and make it real. Mm -hmm. um, they have one that's similar in Britain, where they already have 2 million people, 2 million educators on it, because there is a huge thirst for sharing information with and amongst each other, mm -hmm. where a knowledge profession, mm -hmm. and we don't, we are isolated in so many different ways. Uh, let me ask you about some of the other parts of the school that look called the school reform movement, one of which is e either charter schools or schools that are more independent. Uh, after the storm in New Orleans, as you know, um, well, almost every school on the East Bank of New Orleans became independent. They were all public schools, but they could all run the way they did, and they competed for students. Uh, that caused the schools, in order to compete for students, to stay open until 6 or 7 p.m., even put, you know, medical clinics in the schools because those that had it drew more students than those that didn't, and try to teach 10 and a half, almost 11 months a year, because I don't know about uh, New York and Washington, but dumping a kid in the middle of July in this, you know, for months on end uh, is not a great way to teach or have them uh, a kid come out at three in the afternoon as opposed to six or seven. Could those type of reforms happen with the support of an AFT? Well, let's put it this way. The answer is yes and no. Meaning that take charters, because there's a lot of stuff that you just talked about. Mm -hmm. um, extended learning time, we're part, we're in on that. Real issue is how do you do it and what do you do? So, for example, in Chicago right now, there's a great debate between the mayor and the Chicago Teachers Union, not about extended time, but about how you use it. Um, there's been extended time that has worked brilliantly, and there's extended time that's worked terribly. If you simply, in a junior high school, I saw someone who I think teaches junior, I, I saw some, some, some uh, smiles in the room when I talked about junior high schools. If you teach, kids, and frankly, I think junior high school teachers are the heroes of the earth. I don't know how one <laughs> does that. Other than junior high school you know, parents, yeah. Yes, exactly. <laughs> well, I think parents are the heroes of the earth. But um, 
But the um, but if you just, for example, in junior high schools, teach kids double or triple English periods, um, they get bored out of their mind. So you have to figure out how to do this. So the the best example I've seen, which is extended time, is the Edwards School in Massachusetts. And it was a school that was about to close. Nobody wanted to go. There was a bunch of changes that were made, including using the voice of teachers and this um, Ford Foundation um, uh, time, um, time, uh, more time coalition, which we are part of. And now you have lines of kids who want to go into the school, and the school is breaking all records. So the issue for me is as much the house as the weather. Um, in terms of charters, you know as well as I do that we opened, the UFT, when I was president, opened three charters, mm -hmm. and I was honored this week to <coughs> Saturday to be the speaker at the inaugural um, graduation of the Green Dot Charter School that we started in New York in the South Bronx. 93% of our kids graduated from high school on time. For, um, uh, I would say that um, we'll have four or five more graduating, so we'll be up to 99% graduating by August, mm -hmm. and 100% of them are into college. And, uh, it's and so it is, yeah, we could add a congratulations for the kids. Not for no, us, no, but for the kids. Dot school no, and we, we it's a great, but what I'm saying is, Good Teach for America. Teach there America. is, yes, there is a few amazing Teach for America yeah. teachers that are there. Help. There are. Get the plug in there are. The pack. There but are amazing <laughs> Teach for America teachers. And, and, and part of the mix. I mean, yes. I would agree, and maybe even Wendy would agree, that you don't want it to be the entire channel, but right. that if you're making a great dinner or you're making a great uh, school, you want different things in the mix, right. including the younger, eager. And some, and some Teach for America teachers have become amazing leaders within the United Federation of Teachers. Yeah. And so the issue is, and you know, this is, I guess this is more my mega point, which is, you know, we as a labor movement, teacher union, or at least the AFT, we are not either an anachronism or a luxury. If we actually want to help all kids, the union has to be a partner in this. Now, I may not convince all of you about this, but at the end of the day, if we don't start focusing on solution-driven, um, or focusing on how we are solution-driven, how we problem-solve, how we ensure that all kids get what they need in the public space, instead of this constant polarization, education is not gonna get better. And call me on it. We need to all work together. I'm not being kumbaya, but there needs to be a shared responsibility about the education of our youth in this country since education is so interrelated with the economy. And there needs to be a shared recommitment about public education because public education is the cornerstone of our democracy. So, there, so if we have charters that actually have and are willing to compete um, and use the same kind of standards as the public schools, if they're willing to take the same kids as the public schools, if they're willing to have the same standards, then that's gonna be part of the public education space. But for me, I'm a public education gal. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, I really believe, and call me ideological about this, I really believe public education, where 90% of the kids get educated, is a cornerstone of our democracy. It's a cornerstone of having an educational, an educated citizenry. And we also, at the same time as we do that, have to help all kids, not some kids, be able to meet the challenges of the jobs of today and tomorrow. So for me, it's really important to ensure that kids and parents have neighborhood schools that work for them. Mm -hmm. For me, it's really important to ensure that we stop these fights all the time and really roll up our sleeves to figure out what is the secret sauce of ensuring that all kids get a great education. Mm -hmm. And uh, let me... I'll be off my soapbox now, I'm sorry. Well, I, I, one was the, the, that's a great lead-in to seeing if there's some questions and thoughts. Yes, right back there. And identify yourself because the lights are in my eyes. Hi, I'm Blanca O'Leary. I'm a lawyer and a mom, and I live here in Aspen. Um, when we began a little bit ago, Walter asked Randy a little question about, um, well, he talked a little bit about Teachers for America, and you, your motto is no excuses, and I really respect the work that you do. However, you also mentioned 
that it's an excuse for Randy to bring up that the, the teacher needs to come into the classroom with tools. We would not ask that of a general. We would not ask that of a lawyer. We would not ask that of a doctor. And to say it's an, it's an excuse to not have all their tools, um, I, just, I think that's a little bit unfair. Just a question. Good comment. Uh, and understood. Yes, Michael? Yes. We'll get yeah, that whole tape. We'll just keep, keep I mean, the three there. Yeah. I think that the, what underlies what this lady has said, and my reaction also, is that it's, we know we have really important jobs. But all the other important jobs in America that people think are important, people make sure that you're equipped to do the best that you can do. And so that's why we know we're not going to be equipped 100%. But we need people to help us not only focus on high expectations for kids, but get us the supports we need to do the best job we can do. Yeah. I just had a quick question. The role of student feedback in your evaluation thinking, it seems critical, it's important, and yet we often don't Good ask. Good question. So Mark your hand. OK. So teachers are very um, um, there's a lot of jitteriness about this because everybody thinks about the outlier rather than um, you know what um, rather than the reasonable way to use this. So we are cautionarily, and I'm sure that's not a word. We are in favor of it, and we want to see how it is used. I think Dr. Ron Fryer has come up with some good ways of doing it. For those who don't know, we are working a lot with the Gates Foundation on a bunch of different, in a bunch of different places, Pittsburgh, Hillsborough, to name a couple. And so we think that it's really, we, we think it is one of the multiple measures in terms of how you assess student learning. Mm -hmm. So Randy, uh, Jamie Marisotis with Lumina Foundation. Randy, one of the interesting things, uh, one of your other interesting big ideas is that AFT has become involved in the green jobs and green infrastructure right, right, uh, oh, right. movement. And I, I wonder if you talk about, for, I guess first, what that is. But more importantly, why would a teacher's union be involved in that? So um, look, we are very solution, thank you very much. We are very solution driven right now. And the economy and education are tied in together. And so on a very micro level, what happens in the economy is seen in our classrooms every single day. So the fact that between 2007 and 2010, there has been a 40% loss of net worth in American families, we see that every day. The increase in poverty, we see that every day. So shame on us if we're not involved in jobs, 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 jobs. So what we started doing, and the Clinton Global Initiative has been a huge um, uh, catalyst for this, is that the building trades and the AFT um, and, and the FLCIO and some of the other public unions, but the building trades and the AFT have been the leaders of this. We've been thinking about how you use pensions as a way to invest in infrastructure. And so how you use this big source of capital, $2 trillion around the United States, to invest in a $3 trillion need not in a fiduciarily inappropriate way, but in a fiduciarily appropriate way. And so what we've actually done is that we made a commitment at the Clinton Global Initiative that within five years we'd have $10 billion of investment in infrastructure through pension funds. We'd do a whole bunch of training, and we'd really focus on retrofitting of um, buildings. And we have actually exceeded our commitment in terms of retrofitting of buildings. We've exceeded our commitment in terms of of training, and we already have one billion dollars um, um, allocated in terms of pension investment. Yes, sir, right there. Well, the um, Thank you for asking. Mm -hmm. I'm, uh, I'm not in education. I, I live in Chicago, though, mm -hmm. and um, we have a very strong teachers union there that seems to be at odds with the mayor on virtually every issue. And uh, I think recently they voted with a 90% rate to have a strike at some point. 98% <laughs> to be exact. The, but I heard you say something that sort of describes the way I think a lot of the public in Chicago perceives our teachers union to function now. And that is when you said 
when you were in the teachers union in New York, your efforts were to protect the teachers and do all those things, and you've changed. All the proactive ideas for education appears to come out of the mayor's office. The longer school day, maybe longer years, evaluating teachers, uh, giving higher compensation to better performing teachers, making it easier to get rid of bad teachers, and they pretty much are not in, um, supported by the teachers union. Can you give me some sense as to why we're not seeing more proactive right. um, moves from the teachers union as opposed to just pretty much a no, 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 we don't like this? Good question. That's Go ahead, a really Andy. good question. And let me just, let me take a step back because it's really interesting the difference between what I say and what is heard. When I was the president of the teachers union in New York City, there, I had three installments of being president, it feels like. One was pre-Bloomberg Klein, one was initial Bloomberg Klein, and one was the kind of swan song when I was leaving. The first, before Bloomberg and Klein, I was viewed and the, the UFT was viewed as the reformers in the city. We actually started something called the Chancellor's District with Chancellor Crew, which was viewed as the number one turnaround district um, in the nation. Um, got lots of different awards and things like that. Every single elementary school within that district turned around within two years. We did all sorts of things, including extending the year, extending the day, paying teachers more, having curriculum in English and math that were aligned with what kids need to know and be able to do, and we really broke the back of low achieving schools. Chancellor Klein, as soon as he came in, got rid of that district because they wanted us to be viewed as the obstructionists. Now, oh, wait, wait, that's wait, a wait, bit no, unfair to I've Joel. Joel, I've said this in front of Joel. Joel will tell you in response that he used these things as part of their new redesign. But my point is, you saw, and I'm sure many of you have been in a room where they wanted us to be obstructionists. No one in this room knows about the Chancellor's District. It still is, I think, the number one model in terms of turnaround. The only reason I'm saying it this way is because it became easy. It's really, it's really hard in education to help all kids, and it became easy to make the union the scapegoat. Now, separate and apart from that, I do think we spent too much time on fairness and on protection and too little time on giving teachers the tools, the time, the trust that they need. And that's why I say guilty as charged. But it's not that we didn't do the other stuff as well. So getting to Chicago. In Chicago, I think that there's been a lot of mistakes that have been made. The mayor initially made a mistake by taking away the 4% increase that had been negotiated in a former contract that the mayor had the ability to take away if there was no ability to pay. But there was still budgetarily an ability to pay. That meant, now up for debate, but essentially that when he walked in then, as a result, every single school teacher felt like something that was already negotiated that they had approved was then taken away. Not that they agreed to do it, but then it was stripped. And then the second thing the mayor did was, instead of negotiating with the union about the extended time, he went around and went to different schools and got stymied in that. Now, what has happened since then is that in the polls that I read in terms of Chicago, the public is with the teachers union because they want extended time, but they want it to be done right. And there's a bunch of different districts within Chicago that have said, don't actually have that much extended time, but do it right. So I think there is an opportunity now. So what you saw in that strike authorization vote was really deep, deep, deep frustration of teachers wanting to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. And I think there is an opportunity now, and I've talked to both sides a lot. They're starting to really the, the, the authorization vote was a wake-up call for everyone. And what I'm seeing, and I'm pretty close to it, is that 
there's real conversations for the first time about how to use the time, how to afford it, what to do to make it really enriching, and how to actually work together on making the Chicago school system the best it can be. What the teachers union would say to you right now is that what they really want is not simply ex um, how you use extended time, but the fact that there's not enough guidance counselors to ensure that kids who want to go to college go to college. There's not enough health facilities. There's not enough music and art. There's not enough of that engagement. And what they've put on the table is how they help ensure that all kids get a great education. The way it gets translated is they say no instead of they say yes with. And it's part of, I'll go back to my first point, it's part of this either or debate that we have in education. Um, this is a both and debate. This is how are we gonna ensure that we get kids the best, the most, but also if we don't listen to the voices of teachers in terms of how you implement or what you do, you're gonna have what happened in Chicago. The mayor says this is what works, the union says this is what works, and the two never meet. One way out of that impasse, though, it would seem, would be to have competing schools that tried it different ways. They could all be public schools, all have to be open to all, but where some offer extended learning this way and some right. do that, it's the way the rest of our society works. A Whole Foods offers this, a Safeway does that. Would it be a good idea to break some of the schools into smaller schools and allow more competition and allow parents to choose. I'm not talking about just like some big old voucher system with the big V word. I'm talking about within a public school system, I, let some experimentation happen. So look, I think you have to, I'm a big believer in public school choice and in having a whole bunch of different kinds of models within a public space. I think our biggest problem in public schooling is that we don't sustain what works that's, and you see my anger. That's my only anger towards Joe. But you see my anger that if something was really working, don't get rid of it. Mm -hmm. You can do other things, but don't get rid of something that's really working. So there's, so, so we have to allow for a bunch of experimentation and innovation. But we also have to allow for um, evidence of what works. And when you have evidence of what works, that's what you sustain and that's what you scale up. Something that Jeff Canada said at Goldman Sachs last week was really revelatory. When, when, Carlos Medina said, uh, when Carlos Watson said to him, you got a big audience here. They want to help you. What do you want? And he said, do me a favor. Everybody know who Jeff Canada is? He says, Harlem, yeah. Harlem Enterprise Zone. He said, Children First Enterprise Zone. He says, do me a favor. Don't come to me with your ideas without some evidence behind it. Because the biggest issue we have is we all know great schools. We all know what they look like. We all know the components of them. I have my laundry list of the components. You have your laundry list of the components. But how are we gonna sustain and scale up? So the, you know, the, the, what we used to do is we used to have a bunch of magnet schools. Now we have a bunch of charter schools. We used to have a bunch of Catholic schools. There are very few Catholic schools left. Why don't we do things that have an entrepreneurial bent, but also have that which we sustain and replicate and scale up, is that that has evidence behind it? I think we can all agree on that and that this was a Thank wonderful you. conversation. Thank you. <laughs>